Heavenly Father, as we come back to our studies this morning, we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit, that you would guide and direct uh, the things that we're going to discuss, that they would be presented clearly, um, that your people could be benefited by the knowledge of these things, better prepared to give the warning message at this time, and better settled into the realities that we're living in at this time as well. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I don't want to spend, there's a handout, I don't want to spend the presentation on this handout, but I'll start there. We'll spend some time on it. Um, uh, I haven't looked at how I would uh, lay this out. So on your handout, you've got three, four lines. I'm going to put the first line up here. Will be the, it's the second line on the handouts. What we identified yesterday that started Odilio and Theodore recognizing some things. I guess it's Odilio and Theodore. Seems significant to me um, in terms of the Lord confirming now, trying to remove doubt for people in this movement, that this is the light of the hour and that we are the people that are supposed to give this message. It's, uh, I mean, we've seen it prophetically, we've known it, but I think it's been a little bit discouraging for those of us in this movement and this message to see the, what the shaking did to the numbers and, and, and that, um, and then be confronted with the, the scariest message uh, that's ever been given to a messenger to proclaim, I think, I mean, maybe not, it, that's what Jonah did. He went to a city and said, hey, your city's going to be destroyed in 40 days. Um, so it's, there's other messages that, are, that typify this message, but we've given a scary message. The numbers of the movement have been reduced, um, but the Lord kept opening up light. And as we looked at in Jeremiah 15 yesterday, he says, if you will return to me, and when you apply that to Millerite history, it's speaking about the first disappointment. The Millerites were shaken by the first disappointment, and he says, if you will return to me, you can be my mouth, you can be my spokesperson. So I'm saying we were shaken by <clears throat> this recent experience. This here being September 7th, this being November 9th, and then this is the one I'm saying that most, everyone heard it. I know that everyone that heard it understood the logic. In this room on, on Sabbath, on the 11th of January, the lights clicked on for me. I, I suddenly could see all of Daniel's vision, 10, 11, and 12. And from then on, it's just been trying to accomplish my responsibility to teach it. And that's what I've been doing. I've, it may seem like I've been treading water, but because I see some of these bigger concepts in this, in this last vision since then, I wanted to make sure we went back and put several points of reference in place so when we get to the conclusion, people can follow the logic. That's what I've been doing. And one of the things that we concluded about um, that I've been claiming about January 11th is this is when Gideon goes down into the enemy's camp and he hears the dream and the interpretation thereof and this is where Gideon and the 300 are empowered. Uh, they've been taken down to 300 back here on 9-7. Uh, this is where in the story of Gideon it went, down, went from 10,000 down to 300 and 300 up uh, from 10,000 takes you to 9,700. So this is the final cleansing of Gideon. Uh, the first cleansing was 9-11. Then 9-7 is the second cleansing. Now Gideon's going to go down into the enemy's camp. Um, and this three-step process, um, we understood right away, before we even got to November 9th, that once we came back out of retirement on September 7th, that it was 63 days to November 9th. We saw that right away. And one of the, I don't know how to define this phenomenon, but one of the phenomenons that we're seeing over and over again in the math of things is that you have September 7th here, and 9 times 7 is 63. 
So you've got a, a, uh, a vertical way mark that represents a horizontal way mark. Giving you a second witness right in itself, if that's a correct way to say it. And then when you get to this Sabbath, these are all Sabbaths, which would make it a 777. When you get to this Sabbath, um, it's been another 63 days. And as we said yesterday, this would be midnight. But all of this would be midnight. Okay, so on Sunday, Theodore sent out, this past Sunday, um, a, a link to YouTube where he was doing this presentation. So we, we put that in the record yesterday. And then afterwards, Odilio, I think, and Theodore recognized that from here to here is 63 weeks. And it takes you to March 27th, which is what was opened up on Sunday, maybe before Sunday for Theodore, but what we looked at on Sunday and put in the record. So the point I'm seeing in this is that the Lord made sure Theodore was seeing these things about March 27th for quite some time. He made sure that it, it got connected with me on Sunday so that we could put it in the record here and that everyone that's following this message through this school could watch this truth get opened up and that was designed by the Lord to elicit some confidence some extra needed confidence in what's happening rather than just someone coming up with the complete presentation of a thought this has developed in the past 72 hours and it's it's pretty profound um, and when I was talking to Clayton, my son, yesterday, this is about March 27th, right? One of the things that ties this all together is March 27th. Yesterday, the email that was sent out, there was part of it that was a little bit, I didn't get it, and neither did Clayton. And I was talking to Clayton on the, the phone the other day, and he said he didn't get that. And I said I didn't get it. And then this morning I looked at it again, and I get it now. And it's, it's profound, and it's this. The, the way, the U.S., the American calendar, okay, I'm going to put U.S. here for uh, the American calendar. We would put 9-7 here. We would put 11-9 here. And 1-11 here. But the European calendar, that's European. They do 7-9, 9-11, and 11-1. Okay, so what was recognized by Odilio or Theodore, I don't know which, it really doesn't matter to me, is that if you add these up, <clears throat> if you add 97 to 119 to 111, you get 327. That's March 27th, okay? That's one of the important way marks on this line of 63 and March 27th. But if you reverse it, if you reverse it to the European calendar, where instead of 9-7 you have 7-9 and 11-9 is 9-11 and 1-11 is 11-1 and you add those, that's what we're doing here, then you get 1101. And that's the European expression of January 11th. Which is that, which is profound, because it's taken these three way marks and added them in the American approach to it and produce this way mark. And then when you add them in the European approach, it produces this way mark. <laughs> That's profound, okay? What, are the, what is the uh, probability of being able to create some kind of mathematical structure like that and make it work. Um, it just isn't there. So what I'm saying is this is pretty profound stuff, but I believe this is the Lord, this is Palmoni speaking now 
to the messengers of this movement saying, get ready because this is the movement that's going to carry this message uh, at this time of verse history. And uh, so, now to the, the top line. There's other lines that, that could be on here, but um, the top line on your paper, if you go back to February 15th, 1798. And what happened on February 15th, 1798? Pope taken Papacy receives its deadly wound. And at one level, then that is a close of probation, a closed door. You know, there's, there's several things that's that typifying. But this is the papacy's deadly wound, February 15th, 1798. And if you go over here to August 11th, 1840, which is the time the angel came down in Millerite history, then you have from, from here to here, probably need more room here, you have 15,330 15, days plus 187 days. And what is 187? Okay, so you got a 1533 here, and we've been looking at 1533, and this is July 18th. 187 is the symbol of July 18th. So what is the probability of that happening? And then from here, August 11th, 1840, to October 22nd, 1844, is 1,533 days. So at that level, although I think there is a word for a, maybe there isn't, but this is a chiastic structure. We're dropping the zero here, okay, and in, in You've got a starting point of the papacy receiving deadly wound, a closed door, to the closed door down here of October 22nd. And the center of the chiasm is this, hist this history of 187 days, which would be July 18th. It's saying the center point is July 18th. I, I, maybe I'm out of line for saying it's chiastic structure, but it's 1533 takes you to this way mark, followed by 1533. Of course, to accept it, you've got to understand you can drop a zero. I accept it, so I'm going to leave the zero there. Okay, so this is just another thought on 1533, some more light on 1533. On the third line in your, uh, on your handout is November 9th, 11-9, nineteen eighty nine time of the end Berlin Wall comes down to get to March twenty seventh three twenty seven two thousand nineteen is fifteen hundred and thirty three weeks Okay, January 14th, in 2017, what's January 14th, 2017? That's the day that the truth of Panium was first taught, it was taught up in, on, in Canada, Edmonton area, and if you go from here, on January 14th, to March 27th, 327, 2021, it is 1,533 days. Okay, so we've seen yesterday that from March 27th here, 2019, and 
2020 that this is a chiastic structure and um, why do I have July, 20, July 31st in there? 273 days takes us to December 25th, 2021. And this is 252 days, right? And this is, this is 252. I don't, I don't have yesterday's, yes I had to, I have yesterday's notes. Give me a second here. I, we put this up yesterday, this part of it here. If anyone wants to give me some guidance here because of time, go ahead from the floor. Okay. Um, Is this the Gregorian Julian? Um... Is this the Gregorian Julian? Yeah, this is the one that was 731 yesterday. And, and I have it somewhere, I think. I'm sorry, I'm unprepared here. Okay, yesterday, do you have, did you put it in your notes? Anyone put it in your notes yesterday? I, I'm just looking at the, the chiasm that we looked at yesterday from March 27th, March 27th, March 27th to get the details of that because this is being added to it. And I, I'm not having it right in front of me. From three, oh, uh, 327. 327, 2019 to 327-2021. And it was so many days, was it? 731 days. And what is that? 731 Julian. That's 731 Julian. So it's 731 Julian and 718 Gregorian is the definition of this chiasm, so to say. This is the statement about it. This chiasm from March 27, 2019 to March 27, 2021. The 252 can't be correct. The what? Then the 252 Yeah, this is, this is from another... Um, this is from the... From November 9th to July 18th is 252 days. And from July 18th to December 25th is 525 days. But from July 18th to December 25th, you can also put a way mark in there where you have 273 to December 25th and it creates 252, 252, 273. I'll show you what I'm talking about. This is what I, where I added confusion. And um, don't assume that these are lining up line upon line. If, if you start on November 9th, 2019, and go 252 days, it takes you to July 18th, 2020. And if you go 525 days, it takes you to December 25th, 2021. But, if you go here, put this way mark here, it produces a 252 here. With this 252. And it leaves 273 here. 273 being a symbol of the Levites. Um, and we were looking at that yesterday in terms of what March 27th is all about. And what is this date here? March 27th, 2021. Yeah, it's March 27th. 2021. So this would line up up here. This would be... So this would... 
it's just it's getting some wheels within the wheels. But this is a this is another evidence of the 1533, which we were saying is a symbol of the manifestation of the power of God yesterday. Um, so what's 327, 2021? 327, 2021 is based upon the the rules of prophecy. Okay, the rules of prophecy being that the center of the chiasm is the most important point of reference. Okay, the point, the center of the chiasm is right here. Okay, this 327. This is the most important reference. That, what is that then? One thing at a time. I'm, I'm answering your question. First thing is, is based upon Christ, who's our example in all things, this chiastic structure teaches us that the, the overriding theme of a chiasm is its center point. And this is the chiastic structure of the time when Christ was confirming the covenant. So when it comes to March 27th, 2019, 2020, 2021, the center one is the one that's going to give you the, the overriding theme. And here, on March 27th, last Sabbath, four five days ago, whatever it was, the Adventist Church proclaimed 100 days of prayer, okay, so, which took you to July 4th, 4th of July. So what it is telling us, the center point of March 27th, is it's about Adventism. And who's Adventism in, in, in our message? It's the Levites. Okay, so because of this pandemic, shortly before March 27th, the Adventist church has already shut down church. No one's going to church. And now it proclaims 100 days of prayer. Okay, so now the people in the world are in a position that they're starting to think what's going on with this pandemic. But the Levites, the Levites have, through God's providence, been kept at home on the Sabbath day where they're not supposed to be doing anything, and they've been told you need to pray. Okay, so here, the center point of this chiasm is about Adventism, the, those that have an honest heart beginning to pray so the Holy Spirit can acquaint them with the message of the hour that they haven't been paying attention to because of their circumstances, their connection with the, the Adventist church. When you get to here, in this chiastic structure, when you get to this March 27th, this one here, you come to 273. 273 has already been established as a symbol of the Levites. So the last, the last Waymark in this chiastic structure with the 273 associated with it is about the Levites coming in. The center one is about the Levites being brought into a position where they're praying and they have a reason to pray and they're seeking the Lord. And this one here in, on March 27th, 2019 is when this ministry went into retirement for 150 days for five months. And the day before March 27th, right here on March 8th, the last presentation from here was given and it was called a shut door. Okay, so it, it was identifying the movement that was going to give, the movement and the messenger that was going to give the message to the Levites that are going to come in at this history. This is about the relationship of this movement to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And the center point of it here um, is that God, through His providence, has put the Adventist church now in a position where they're praying for light, right at the time that He's raising up a movement that has the light for the hour. How do, I know what you're saying, but how do we justify what we've taught in the past about the Seventh-day Adventist church was passed by at 9-11 by the rejection of the message? Are we just saying this is for the people's movement? Or? Yeah, it's it's it's... It's just what, it, it's what we referred to yesterday, that without a doubt, the Hebrew church 
Acts, probation closed in AD 34. But in Great Controversy, it says that the Lord in His mercy gave them another 40 years um, to speak to the hearts of those children that hadn't heard the message. It, it, this isn't putting any endorsement on the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is, is just as passed by as the Protestant Church was on October 22nd, 1844. But they are, the, they are the point of reference that the Levites come out of. Can this be represented by the Omega apostasy as far as the leadership in that but yet having opportunity for some to still come out okay. Uh, that was kind of a convoluted question. You want to restate it? Well, I'm saying, is there a, a, is there a possibility is for there some a people in the Omega movement to come out with those Adventists? Yeah, I'm saying you're you're saying that the no, no, I don't think so. Church is passed by. Yeah, that's a yes, different. but that the their Levites are in there. Yeah. Uh, are there any honest in heart left in the Omega? I don't know. I don't know, but I I don't know. But my my black and white answer is no. Because that's a different line. Okay, that's, that is a line of the temple cleansing that went on in this movement. Okay, the, and the temple cleansing that went on in this movement, it, it, did, it, was, it wasn't being fulfilled in the Adventist church. Um, but there may be honest heart in there, but it wouldn't be... That's not what's being illustrated here. They may, the Lord in His mercy is no doubt going to save some out of there, but that's a different line. You follow me? Yeah, and, I've just seen similarities, and I wondered if they, that was. Yeah. Okay. Could be put on the same line. I don't think so. It's a different line. I, 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 as I begin over here, putting the lines of Daniel eleven on, I'm going to show that in our, in the kingdom of the 144,000 remember we're looking at four kingdoms in Daniel 11 the kingdom of the dragon the kingdom of the beast the kingdom of the false prophet and the kingdom of the 144,000 and in the kingdom of the 144,000 there's three storylines okay in the kingdom of the dragon the storyline is the king of the south in the kingdom of the beast the storyline is Fatima and the kingdom of the false prophet is the the storyline of the constitution that's where their kingdom story plays out but in the kingdom of the 144,000, it plays out on three lines, prophet, priest, and king, okay? The line of the king is, the, it's King David. It's the, the story of the sanctuary and the throne of David being reestablished. Uh, re the the storyline of the priest is the story of the sanctuary and the priests and the Levites. And the storyline of the prophets, prophets, priests, and kings, is the storyline of Elijah at Carmel, Carmel, and it's in that story that you see this movement, okay? And the Parmenderan test is Parmenders the guy, uh, that's the prophets of Baal, Tess is the priest of the grove, male, female gods, in opposition to Elijah, okay? So there, what I'm saying is there, there's a very, very specific line about this movement. And it's not, it's not at this point addressing Adventism. Okay, it, if you're going to see Adventism in the story of Carmel, then you have to wait till you get down here to the Sunday Law. Okay, because the story of Elijah plays out here again. The um, story of Elijah is going to play out three times. But, okay, that, that there, this information up here, this is, I mean, don't miss this, whether it's U.S. or European, the total is, it's speaking either about March 27th or January 11th. What happened on January 11th? Just as we close this out. What happened on January 11th? Gideon went down into the enemy's camp and he heard the dream and the interpretation thereof. The light of Daniel is opened up. Okay, He's ready to go now. He's got the message. So what happened on January 11th in terms of Daniel? One, two, third touch. 
be strong, be strong. Okay, so right here, the the message, the messenger, is, and the messengers plural are are ready. Okay, They're, now now what's going to happen? The Lord's going to divide them into three groups. They're going to come into unity. They have to come into unity. Okay, so he's he's putting a confirmation on January 11th as a waymark here on the European expression. But up here in the American expression of these dates, he's putting a confirmation on March 27th. March 27th, only Theodore really was looking at that for a long period of time, but he really didn't have his hand, a grasp of it from what I understand until here recently. And now we're seeing March 27th is a story about Adventism, about the Levites. So this is about the Levites coming in and this is about the priests that call them in and it's woven into this number 1533 over and over again in many profound ways closed doors manifestation of the power of God I'm I'm sure someone that has an aptitude on on numbers could do more with that than I'm doing right here, but this is opportunity for the honest heart of in the Levites group that gets connected to this um, this YouTube presentation. However, you're watching this out on the internet to start waking up to the the power and authority of Palmoni um, because you have to settle into that to to grasp the light of this hour. Okay, so, I'm going to start here with Daniel 11 and the King of the South. And we handed out, recently, this, this paper on the King of the South. This isn't the final word on anything, but what I'm saying is, in Daniel's last vision, there are four kingdoms. What's the most important kingdom? God's people, the 144,000. Therefore, the first thing we're told in Daniel's last vision is chapter 10. And you have to believe that you're part of those people represented by Daniel. Because in Daniel 10, when this vision, what vision? This vision of midnight, um, which would be right here, when this truth comes in, this is the vision of midnight, 9-7, November 9th, January 11th, when it comes into history, what happens to this group, this movement, based upon Daniel 10? The majority of the men that were with Daniel fled. Okay, this is the Mare vision here. Is it the Mare vision? Is it the Mare vision? In Daniel 10, it's definitely the Mare vision. It's the appearance of Christ that Daniel sees, and the, the men that were with him, what did they do? They fled. But that vision is also what vision? In the visions given to Ezekiel, Isaiah, and John, and Daniel, that's the midnight vision of Ezekiel 1.1 in the 30th year. November 9th being that date perfectly, but you can't separate 9-7 or 1-11 from November 9th. Why? Because it's a chiasm. It's a chiastic structure. They have to be considered together. So when God's people come to this history here, Dan there's a group of people with Daniel, isn't there? And they flee, leaving Daniel, leaving Gideon down here, all by himself with Pira in the enemy's camp when the Lord opens up the book of Daniel. So the first kingdom in Daniel's last vision is in Daniel 10, and it's the kingdom of the 144,000. And in verse 14, Gabriel says, Now I've come to show you what shall befall thy people in the latter days. He gives the summary of what chapter 10 is about. What's chapter 10 then? It's a test on whether you're going to see this or not. Why is it a test? 
because it's chapter 10 and it's midnight because midnight is 21 and how many 21s are in are explicitly put in Daniel 10 three okay he's fasting for 21 days there's 21 verses and Gabriel struggles with Cyrus for how many days the same days 21 so in those 21 days you have a struggle going on with the king of Pers kings of Persia and Daniel's fasting so that's the most important kingdom in there, but the other kingdoms are the kingdom of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And the storyline of the kingdom of the dragon is the story of the king of the south. And I'm saying that this, that in each of the three, in all the storylines, they illustrate a struggle between, at a very simple, simplistic way, what's the struggle between? Pardon me? Who's gonna rule? Who's gonna rule? In all four storylines, Kingdom of the 144,000, the dragon, the beast, false prophet, liberals and conservatives, okay? It's, it, it, there may be different kind of liberal and conservatives in the lines, but it's always about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And I'm saying that when was it that the king of the south came into prophetic history as a symbol. As a symbol. I, I know there were kings of the south and kings of the north, literal kings of the south and kings of the north in biblical history, but... 1989? No. 1798. 1798. 1798. We see what? The king of the south push against the king of the north. Right? Yes. Okay, so the king of the south, KS. This is his storyline is what I'm saying. But in the paper, where do I mark the connection between the king of the south and the king of the north? The first connection at least. If you read the paper. Did you read the paper? What, what paper? This paper on the king of the south. Did you read it? Where, where, okay, this, uh, all right, the first place that I note in the pa paper is 1789. Why? What happened in 1789? The Constitution. The Constitution. Was Constitution's put in place in 1789, in 1789 in the United States. Who's the primary author of the Constitution? Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. Who did he collaborate with on the Constitution? France. Oh, Laf no. John Paul Lafayette. Yeah, yeah. And and what what Constitution did John Paul Lafayette contribute to that was not the American Constitution? French. The, the the French, but it's not called. You can call it the French Constitution, I guess. But what's it called? The, the Rights of Man. And when did that come into history? 1789. Okay, so you got it. In, in 1789, you've got the, con the story of the Constitution coming into history, and it takes place in France with the rights of man, and in the USA with the American Constitution. This is going to be the King of the South. All right, but it's connected right here with the USA, okay? It, it's not yet, uh, technically I wouldn't call it the King of the South until you get to 1798, okay, prophetically. But this is how, where the King of the South comes into history, and it's directly connected with the United States. And some people that comment on the rights of man, the document that came into France in 1789, and the Constitution, of the United States in 1798, some people have a very simplistic definition of the difference of the two documents. And what is that? It's in the paper that you all read. One led to uh, athe atheistic revolution. And, uh, no? No. That, that might be in the paper too. I don't remember. Is it this constitution in the rights of man doesn't mention 
God. And the American Constitution does. Okay, so there's, there is a, at least a seed of, of information there about what's going to happen. And now what, what happens in the, the, with the rights of man and the history that follows, Larry? And that's when the French it produces an atheistic country. An atheistic revolution. Um, and this is, this is a, a revolution has taken place in the United States leading up to this point, and now uh, a revolution is going to take place in France, okay, that's going to bring about what we call atheism, communism, and any comments on that? So here we see the king of the south is going to prevail over the king of the north. And as we move down to history, we get to this way, Mark. And what is that? What's happened to the king of the south? This is, this is France. Now this king of the south is Russia. Russia. So but we didn't see it. We thought it was the Soviet Union. And here, the king of the north prevails over the king of the south. Okay, so we have this history going in. And all of this, by the way, now, disregarding the paper, we've, we've mentioned from here on out the, these things in this class leading to this point. Um, so you should all have some familiarity with it if you've been in here. We have... Uh, in this storyline, what do we have that comes to a conclusion in 1989 that speaks to the story of the King of the South? Okay, a wall. What else? A proxy war. For 10 years. Was there a, is there a proxy war going on in Syria right now? Um, is it the same players? This proxy war was between the United States and Russia and it was carried out in an Islamic country and in 2011 a proxy war began in Syria and the main players are once again the United States and Russia in a Islamic country. Was there a pro... Uh, and it's... That was 10 years. We're identifying this as going to 2021, which would be 10 years. Was there a 10-year proxy war in the history of the Millerites? Yes. Was it between the United States and Russia? No, it was between the King of the South and the King of the North. You remember it? Um, that proxy war, I'll put it over here just to remind us. If I, if it began in 1831, I believe, to 1833 was the main battle, and then from 1838, if I recall right, to 1841 was the end of it, this being this three years at the beginning, this three years at the end. In the beginning, who's it between, who's it between in prophetic expression? It's between the king of the north and the king of the south. Who was the king of the north in this Millerite history? Turkey, what we would call the Ottoman Empire. Who was the king of the south? Egypt. Okay, so in this beginning of this, what they call the Ottoman-Egyptian War, that's the label of it, um, who won this initial three-year war? The King of the South, Turkey, prevailed over the King of the North. But down here in this history... You, I think you mean Egypt, right? Yes, Egypt. Egypt's the King of the South? Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah, you're right. And then at the end in this three years, who prevailed over who? 
the king of the north over the king of the south. You see any you see any thing being typified here? Raphael yes. And the, well, Rafi and Paniam, but also here. This is this is the king of the south here prevailing over the king of the north in 1798, and then in 1989 it's reversed. King of the north prevails over the king of the south. This is the same as here. Okay, and so this is an illustration of what. Daniel, the history of Daniel 11, verse 40. Because this, this is Daniel 11, verse 40, is it not? Is 1225 the Sunday law? Yes. Mm -hmm. And do you remember? We've already put it in the record. People may have thought we were just rambling here. And we're wondering where we were going. But I've told you all along, I was putting planks in place to get to this climax of all this. Does everyone remember all the December 25ths that we've identified in sacred history? There are there, uh, who, okay, keep it simple. Who were they all associated with? The dragon. The dragon, okay. The first, the first temple dedicated to the sun in the Roman Empire took place, I don't remember the year, but it was on December 25th. Charlemagne's made the, the, what they call him, the, 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 the emperor of the Roman Empire, but it's not that. There's a, a technical expression. On December 25th, the year 800, um, Clovis was baptized into the Catholic Church on December 25th, 496. Um, Gorbachev brought down the Soviet Union on December 25th, 1991 and took a job at the United Nations. Uh, help me now, there's some other ones. December 25th is associated with the dragon and the worship of the sun. Okay, the, it, it, and the Roman church. So this December 25th is not only paralleling the December 25th of 1991, it's marking the Sunday law. Okay, so, so the point that I'm trying to get is that from here to here, is what? It's verse 40. It's verse 40. And in verse 40, you have a line here that the king of the south prevails over the king of the north, and then the king of the north prevails over the king of the south. Okay, but this has been typified back in Millerite history with this proxy war. And this proxy war is the, it, the theme of this proxy war allows you to bring it into here where the king of the south prevails over the king of the north and then the king of the north prevails over the king of the south. And when we got there, when we were looking at proxy wars, what did we do? Do you remember? Okay, I won't go back through it. But we showed, if you were willing to see, that Daniel 11, 31 through 33 illustrates this history, and Daniel 11, 38 through 41 illustrates this history as well. Yes. Okay, so, it's, so it's, it's really connected airtight. So we have one illustration of King of the South, King of the North struggle here, and then we have a proxy war and a proxy war, but these two proxy wars are based upon the, the rule of first mention, the proxy war in Millerite history, and the rule of first mention says the proxy war is about the struggle between the king of the south and the king of the north, in which the king of the south first wins a battle, and the king of the north wins the second battle. And when the Lord removed his hand from a foundational truth, that we had from 1989 when we thought that the, the King of the South was the Soviet Union, but it wasn't, it was Russia. When he removed his hand from that understanding in December of 2017, then we could see what? Raphia and Paneum. And what's Raphia and Paneum in the terms of what we've just been speaking about? This would be Raphia at a simplistic level. And this would be Paneum. Right? Now, 
in, in between 1989 and the Sunday Law, we have to see Raphia and Paneum. That's what the Lord removed his hand from. Yes? Okay, so I'm going to move this proxy war out. All I want us to see is that that was part of the testimony, but I don't want it to get so busy that you can't follow this. Uh, yep. Where did you get the information about the, the, the war there between Egypt and... Uh, Google Ottoman-Egyptian War. Okay. And this is, this is like the first and the second. And there is a break in time here. You have to, you have to be willing to see this this break in time. Do you see a break in time in, in the verse 40? No. Yeah, so it's, it's justified. So anyway, I, that's the proxy war stuff. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move away from that. And I'm going to put in here between 1989 and the Sunday Law, we have to have Raphia and Paneum. Okay, so I'm going to take some other stuff off here. I'm saying that this is the storyline of the King of the South. Okay, so the King of the South is the dragon. This is the story of the dragon. So the dragon wins the first time around and he loses the second time around. Right? King of South wins, then he loses. So, what we've been trying to bring into this study of Daniel 11 is chapter 15 of what? Matthew. Matthew chapter 15? Okay. How, who, n who, who, Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Jeremiah 15 we've mentioned, but no. Not Matthew 15. Where'd we start? Genesis 15. Why, why do we want to bring Genesis 15 into this? Because of God's judgment of the four, or the three of his people, Egypt. The judgment. Yeah. Okay. He's going to judge three entities. He's going to judge his people, the nation where his people were put. Where was the nation that his people were put at the end of the world? In the USA, and in Genesis 15, the Amorites represent the ten kings. They're associated with ten kings in chapter 15 of Genesis. And the first fulfillment of that prophecy was in the time of Moses. When was, when was God's people judged in the story of Moses? At Passover. Um, the Passover is the cross. The cross is judgment. When was Egypt judged? The Red Sea, but it was progressive, right? It was being judged in those plagues, but it was progressive. When was the Amorites judged? I, I, when they're coming out of the Promised Land after 40 years, the Amorites are going to get judged. But could they have been judged almost immediately thereafter? Yes, but because of the rebellion, instead of taking two years to go into the Promised Land, they took 40 years. But nevertheless... The Amorites were the ten kings of Genesis 15 and the ten kings of Revelation 17. Egypt is the United States, and God's people are God's people. So when we're looking at this history, we're looking at the history of judgment. Right? American way to spell it. So... What I've been claiming is that we'll see the, the, the dynamics of Raphia and Paneum in each of these entities that are judged. Okay, we're going to see the, the characteristics of Raphia and Paneum in the storyline of the United States, which is the storyline of the Constitution. 
We're not done with the king of the south. We have more to say about the king of the south. But I'm going to bring this down to a conclusion to make a couple points here. We're going to see the, the dynamics, the characteristics of Raphia and Paneum in the storyline of the king of the south and in the storyline of, of the beast. And in the storyline of who? That's the USA. And in the storyline of the 144. So, <clears throat> when did we, where did we say that Rafi and Paneum were fulfilled for the false prophet, for the United States, in the storyline of the Constitution. That's past tense. Nope. You're guessing again. Nope. You're guessing again, too. Okay, where we said we've seen Rafi and Paneum in the storyline of the Constitution in the United States was the impeachment of Donald Trump. Yeah. And then his release. And then his acquittal. acquittal. And we have dates for those. Anyone remember the dates? He was acquitted when? January 5th, because it's 25. January 20, 220. February. No, February 5th. That's February 5th. And his impeachment was on. Twelve, ten, nineteen. 10, 19. Okay, I have it in the notes. So, what am I saying here? Here's what I'm saying here. And I, please think this through. I think you, I spelled acquittal wrong. Possib maybe two T's? A-C-Q. T-T. Okay. I'm saying in the storyline of the United States, this was Raphia. And this is Paneum. We've been saying that, even though it hasn't necessarily sunk in. Don't go there yet. In Raphia, let's face it, let's face it, was there any justification whatsoever to bring articles of impeachment against Donald Trump? No. None whatsoever. There was, it was in, in legal, therefore legally, was there any way that anyone would have actually expected them to bring articles in, of impeachment? No. no. There was no evidence. Did they do it? Yes. In this history of Raphia, the real history of Raphia in Daniel 11, did the world think that the king of the south was going to defeat the king of the north? No. The king of the north was superior in every way. It was a total upset victory, the battle of Raphia. No one expected it to happen. Remember? That's the story of Raphia. Remember? Okay, so the fact that they brought the art articles of impeachment is exactly the same as Raphia. No one, there was no legal justification and no one thought it could happen because it just couldn't happen. But it did happen. That was Raphia. And from this point on, what's going to happen, based upon the line of the King of the South that we're not done yet, is the Democratic Party is going to collapse. And brothers and sisters, I've seen on the news today, they're talking about not having a presidential, um, what do you call it? Convention yeah. for the Democratic president. Yeah, because they're all, all their um, 
caucuses and the primaries has all been... Yeah, but they're talking about shutting down the convention. Yeah. So, I mean, it's collapsing. What's the, what's the main power of the Democratic Party? The liberal news. What's happening to the liberal news? It's, it, it's, it's collapsing. Okay, so I'm saying that, that this is a, a reality of Rafia. The King of the South wins this unexpectedly. And read about it in your thoughts on Daniel and Revelation. Um, when, when Ptolemy has this victory, he, he isn't benefited from it. From that point on, he's, he goes into drunken debauchery and comes to his end. Okay, and that's, I'm saying this is a characteristic of this first battle, whether you plug it into the false prophet or to Russia or to Catholicism, you're going to see that. That the first battle, the dragon wins, but from there on, it's the dragon falling apart. Until you get to Paneum, and in Paneum, the king of the north wins. Did Donald Trump, the Republicans, win on 2520? Yes. So, if you go back to January 14th, 2017, is that a waymark? Yes. yes, it is a waymark. So, if it's a waymark as a student of prophecy, what do you need to do? You need to know it, right? You need to understand what it was. And it's, it's on the, it's, I thought we had it on here. Ah, it's right there. It's right there. What did we teach about Paneum on January 14, 2017? Oh, okay. pandemic. Okay. Mm. Pandemic. Pandemic. All the pans. One at a time. A pandemic. Panic. Yeah. Okay. We see both of those right now, since this point in time, do we not? Mm -hmm. Okay, but after that point in time, here not so long ago, we came to understand that July 18th was going to be Paneum. But it's not Paneum, this isn't Paneum for this kingdom. No. What Paneum is it for? It's for the 144,000. Yeah. Good on you. Okay. This is Paneum too. This is Paneum also. The Sunday Law is Paneum also. What Paneum is that for? That's for the world. Well, uh, that's, a, that's kind of a generic way to say it. <laughs> this is the, oh. in the line of the King of the South. Yeah, and the South is defeated. The South is defeated here. So this, this is Paneum for this line, for the King of the South. This is Paneum for the 144,000. And this is Paneum for the United States. Where's Paneum for the beast? It's at the close of human probation. Okay, it's down here. But, now here's what I want you to see, if you will, as we close. I'm a little bit over time. When we got to July 18th and the fireballs on Nashville, those of you that haven't been paying attention or were not, have not watched, go back and look. I don't know exactly when it was. Anyone know when it was? Odilio and Stephen were still here. It's right before they left when we began opening up Nashville. Whatever time frame that was, you get on the YouTube. Is that where you access these things? Get on YouTube and look particularly at Daniel Fontenot's presentations. I mean, look at them all because Odilio and Stephen are going to be laying out the chronology. But what was Daniel emphasizing about July 18th Paneum? Do you remember? I remember, so I'm going to tell you. In Nashville, what do you have there that is the, yeah. the bullseye? The, uh, the, the Pantheon Parthenon Temple. The, the, the temple, the Parthenon Temple. Parthenon, yeah. and, and where, uh, uh, education, why are you saying education? Higher education. That's what he was talking about. Okay, he was talking about higher education, and we were, we were making the connection 
that Sister White was identified in her lifetime when she was referring to the destruction of Nashville. She was right there at one level speaking about true education and false education. Because that's where, that's where the main school was. What was the main school? Um, Madison College Madison is in College. Nashville, Tennessee. Right, Madison Okay, College. and Madison College is the only board that Ellen White ever yeah. agreed to be a board member on. Mm -hmm. This was her endorsement of true education, and it was right there in Nashville where the Parthenon Temple was, and the Parthenon Temple is a Greek temple, which is the symbol of education. So this was a storyline about a judgment against false education. And remember, the primary reason that the theologians will point out, and probably correctly so, that Christ was crucified was because of Greek education. Amen. Greek education had been incorporated into the culture of the Jews a couple hundred years before Christ come on scene. So when he came on scene, they had closed off their ability to recognize the message of the hour. To recognize what? The time of their visitation. Greek education destroys your ability to recognize the day of visitation. Amen. And the Parthenon Temple is a symbol of Greek education, but what else is it a symbol of? Paganism. Um. Paganism, okay. Yeah. Pantheon Temple, it's Parthenon Temple, but it, it's got the, the goddess in there that is the, the a goddess that is the Virgin Mary at one level and the Mother Earth at another level, but that's not what I'm getting at. What are the Greeks probably famous most for? commonly famous for? Sports. They're, they're what? Eating. Sports. Sports. Oh, Sports. Sports. The athletic, yeah, it, games what, and all that kind of stuff. the athletic games, what do we call them? Olymp the Olympics. The Olympics. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm telling you is this. Panium, that is the midnight cry, and Panium, that is the loud cry. Panium for the 144,000, and Panium in the story of the King of South is still ahead. But God judges is in the process of judgment and he judges individuals, nations, and the entire world the same. And this is the close of judgment. And the first illustration that we have of Panium is here with the Constitution and the United States and what has happened to the schools, the educational systems on planet Earth in this history. They're closed. education and sports. And sports. What has happened to the sports industry on planet Earth yeah. since then? Sports closed. So what I'm saying is what's went on in this line is typifying what is going to happen in even a more profound way here and a more profound way here. And if, if you if you can't read this handwriting on the wall, you're in trouble. It's not just a pandemic that Panium brings or a panic, and we're seeing those. It's striking out a Greek education and idolatry mm -hmm. as represented in sports. I mean, they closed the Olympics. They closed the football, the soccer, the hockey, the baseball. The basketball and all the schools. What else has went on? And what I'm saying is these are, this is the first revelation of Paneum in this line and it's simply a harbinger of a more serious manifestation of this Paneum and then this Paneum. What else is happening? Churches. Let's not say closed. I don't want to say closed in the churches. Churches are being governed or restricted. Let's say restricted. Are they not? 
arrested in Florida for holding them. Arrested in some of the states. What else is happening? It's not really happening. When I say this, you're going to say, well, it's not really happening. But it is it's really, it's, it's a harbinger. It's really happening. Martial law. They're, start, they're starting to tell you, you can't leave your state, you can't leave your city, you can't come into our city. You're going to have to self-quarantine if you come here. I forgot what state connects right next door to New York. New Jersey. Rhode Island. Rhode Island. So you had Rhode Island uh, was it, was it police or the National Guard were going door to door to see if there were any, anyone from New York in the state. Wow. But we do need to temper that with the fact that they're doing it because they don't want people to get sick and die. Hey, oh, it's, okay. They, oh, okay, it's not so like, oh, they're, they're putting yeah. martial law. Th that's control. exactly what we've always said about the Sunday law. I don't want but don't, is don't, it, it's yeah. going to seem reasonable yeah, but to the people that don't understand the issues. Who was it during Obama's administration that said... Never... Never uh, always take advantage of a crisis. Whatever yeah. it was, the yeah. the black oh. attorney general, Ron Emanuel. Emanuel, yeah. There are never let a good states. crisis go to waste. Yeah. Yeah. never let a good crisis go to waste. There, there oh, see, we're, you're yeah, fact. There are states that some of them that are are starting to say, well, let's just close down on Sunday, and we'll be open the rest of the day. I was just reading it on the internet. And so they are starting to do it more and more as far as let's just shut everything okay. down, give everyone a rest. Yeah, it, so from this, I'm going to speak to two things here that what Brahman said and what Daniel said. Number one, we don't need to get into any conspiracy theories here at this point. That's not the point. And we don't need to justify the activities that are going on. What we need to see is that the first occurrence of Paneum here on this line, because these four kingdoms are the story of Daniel 11, and it's the story of judgment, and he judges all the same. He's going to judge his people, the nations, and the world under the same guidelines, under the same dynamics. All we really need to see here is that the crisis that was brought about by this Paneum between the Democrats and the Republicans is giving us harbingers of what's coming here at, at blinding speed. You can see it's a type of martial law. You can see the pandemic easily. You can see the panic on Wall Street. And there's, this is all a fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins, is it not? Yeah, yeah, it's a fair... The ones that are prepared, don't worry. But what, what I, I want to put another little prophetic nuance in there, not that detailed, but you're right, is that even though people aren't paying much attention to it, there is an oil crisis going on right now. Is that how you spell crisis? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a crisis of oil. That's the crisis of the parable of the ten virgins. So in this history, you have Greek education being spoken to. Greek sports being spoken to, restrictions being put on churches, panic on Wall Street. Sister White says money will devaluate very rapidly. Okay, money's devaluating very rapidly and it's making the dollar the strongest it's ever been. They're having to fight to keep the dollar weak. It's and what does it say in Testimonies, Volume 9? Struggling in vain. They are struggling in vain to put business operations on a more secure basis. So what I'm saying is this paneum here is teaching us these characteristics, these characteristics for what's going to happen here at the Midnight Cry. But this paneum is the paneum for the 144,000. This is the paneum here at the Sunday Law for the King of the South. And down here at the close of probation. That's the paneum for the papacy. And why is that? Because right here you're going to have a threefold union. And I'll just give you an overview. We'll come back. We'll come back and... Between 1225 and close of probation would be the one hour? Yeah, that's the one hour for sure. That's the one hour. But I want, I want you to think through one thing in advance. 
of getting there. The storyline of the beast is the story of Fatima. And the story of Fatima says there's going to be a limited nuclear third world war. That's what Fatima taught since 1917. Uh, they didn't say nuclear war in 1917 because they didn't know anything about nuclear war. But they talk about this world war with the weapons of mass destruction that some entire countries, the Fatima prophecy says, are going to be eliminated. We're saying from here to here, there's going to be a third world war. That's what I'm saying. And how does the Fatima prophecy say the third world war ends? The return of Christ. Does that agree with inspiration? Yes. yes. Because at the Sunday law, in Revelation 13, 11, two verses later in Revelation 13, 13, Satan appears to personate Christ. And the Fatima prophecy says they know it's Christ because he calls fire down out of heaven. And verse 13 says Satan's going to call fire down out of heaven. And the Fatima prophecy says because they know it's Christ, then they're going to turn the Catholic Church over to Christ. He's going to be the Pope that rules through this history. Who is he? He's the dragon. He's the dragon himself. Here, he wins this battle at the threefold union. And he takes control of the threefold union in fulfillment of the Fatima prophecy. So this is continuing on now. Does he win here? Who wins here? The real king of the north. This is the real battle of the king of the south and the king of the north. And Satan becomes, not becomes, he pretends to be Christ right here, taking control of the threefold union. So what I'm saying is, these lines, <laughs> these lines are parallel lines, and what's going on right now, what's going on right now, prophetically, at this level, is telling us where we are and what our message is. And over here at this level, Palmoni is telling us you are the ones that I have chosen to present this message. It's the travail of the woman. It's the birthing of the man of sin. It's, it's just the first labor pains have started until he is birthed. Okay, so you're saying labor pain, labor pain, labor pain, and there he is. I don't have a problem with metaphors like that, I guess but I don't know where the cap is. Shall we pray? pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are bringing to light truths that are for us, especially to confirm to us as your humble followers that you have actually chosen us to do a work and that you are willing and able to finish this work with us if we will simply walk in the light that is proceeding from the throne. Thank you for that light. Um, we are in a crisis, uh, but we can have joy at this very time because we know that you can take us through this crisis. Thank you for your prophetic word that is clearly identifying the issues in front of us. And as we part now, we ask a blessing on the rest of our day's service for you. In Jesus' name, amen.